jazz? We don't use the word jazz. We believe you just can't find a category big enough to combine so much different music. If you travel to a country where a tiny percentage have even heard the word, it's useless. But if what you present to people is believable, they respond. And that's all we can depend upon. During the decades since his death in May of 1974, Duke Ellington's standing as one of America's greatest composers has only increased. In a body of work that encompasses well more than a thousand compositions, he vastly expanded the expressive potential of jazz and helped to establish a more fluid relationship between American popular and classical music. The richness of Ellington's art was informed by a wide variety of elements, and an exploration of these features' diverse sources provides a fuller understanding of his most ambitious works. For much of his youth, he was more interested in the visual arts than in music, and his abilities were significant enough to be offered a scholarship by the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. But when he first encountered ragtime piano playing in his mid-teens, his focus began to change, and before long he was sneaking into a local pool hall, listening to the capital city's best players for hours. Finally, he came home one afternoon, walked up to his mother, and simply announced, Mother, your son is going to be one of the great musicians in the world, and someday I'm going to be bowing before kings and queens. Absurd as this might have sounded, Daisy Ellington had always thought of her son as uniquely blessed, instilling in him a supreme self-confidence that would support his most sweeping artistic visions. And while his talents as a visual artist would remain undeveloped, they would indirectly find their expression in his music. As he'd later note, practically everything we wrote was supposed to be a picture of something. Shortly after moving to New York in the fall of 1923, Ellington became the leader of a six-piece band called the Washingtonians. This group became the forerunner of the larger Duke Ellington Orchestra, the name given to the ensemble when it became the house band at Harlem's famed Cotton Club in 1927. Ellington would lead the orchestra in various iterations for the remainder of his life, and he considered its existence so indispensable to his creative aspirations, it was often said that his instrument was the band itself, that in later decades he would often imperil his personal finances simply to keep it going with a relatively stable roster of musicians. During the band's four-year engagement at the Cotton Club, Ellington's distinctive style, characterized by extended harmonies, expressive dissonance, and unusual textures, began to emerge. His reputation grew rapidly through weekly broadcasts over the CBS radio network and a contract with the agent and publisher Irving Mills, who published his music and marketed him as a serious composer who was making a lasting contribution to American music. While Ellington's expansive harmonic and textural palette led many to assume he'd studied the music of composers such as Debussy, Ravel, and Delius. His awareness of these musicians' innovations was second-hand. During the 1920s, he was mentored by two African-American composers with classical training, Will Marion Cook and Will Votary. Cook had studied with Dvorak during his tenure as director of the National Conservatory of Music in New York. A strong proponent of the Czech master's idea that African-American music could become the basis of a great American school of music, he urged Ellington to think beyond the limits of the conventional three-minute jazz tune. Votary, who served as a librarian for the Philadelphia Orchestra and the Chicago Symphony before going on to a successful career as a composer and arranger on Broadway, worked more closely with Ellington, helping him to assimilate some of the most notable developments in early 20th century European art music by conveying them within the uniquely appropriate context of music for a Broadway theater orchestra. In Ellington's words, Votary's valuable lectures in orchestration and chromaticism penetrated my ear and are largely responsible for the way I think about music. Ellington's Harlem Suite, sometimes called A Tone Parallel to Harlem, was ostensibly written for Arturo Toscanini's NBC Symphony in 1951. The last in a string of extended compositions that began in 1943 with his jazz symphony Black, Brown, and Beige, the piece was premiered by the Ellington Band in January of that year and then orchestrated for performance with the NBC Symphony in June. 
In his memoirs, Ellington described the suite's programmatic content. It's Sunday morning. We're strolling from 110th Street up 7th Avenue, heading north towards 125th Street. Everybody's nicely dressed, friendly, and on their way to or from church. Standing on the opposite side of the street, under a street lamp, is a beautiful woman. She, too, is in a friendly mood. You may hear a parade go by, or a funeral, or you may recognize the passage of those who are making our civil rights demand. Although this musical travelogue has prompted comparisons with Gershwin's An American in Paris, this suite inhabits a different world. Even in Ellington's most extended compositions, jazz always remains at the center, while classical resources provide expressive and textural enhancement. The aspects of 20th century art music in his work simply deepen and amplify the essential quality of lived experience that makes his art so compelling. Ellington's music can be complicated, but it's never abstract. His mission was to translate the fullness of human existence into sound with directness and authenticity, a sensibility he expressed succinctly in a famous quip, sing sweet, but put a little dirt in it. <laughs>